This morning, uh, you know, last week we, uh, we looked at, we, we began to dive into the different spiritual stages. And we, we, last week we looked at the spiritually dead and how God wants us, Jesus wants us to become spiritually undead. And we all have to start somewhere, right? And of course, God's word says that we start out, whether we like it or not, whether we want to hear it or not, we start out as spiritually dead. But he invites us into this new life, right? To become spiritually undead and be born again and walk with him. And one of the stories that we looked at last week was the man who had been an invalid for 38 years and he's by the pool and Jesus is walking through and he turns to this man and he asks the question, do you want to get well? And it seems like a ridiculous question. It seems like a mean question because why would he go, well, well no, I, I would rather lay here for another 38 years and suffer, right? But here's the thing. As we looked at that last week, oftentimes spiritually, God asks us the same question, right? Do you want to be well? And sometimes we say yes, and other times you're like, well, I, I mean, I, I do, but... What does your version of yes look like that? Look like God, and do I want that? And so there are people who still say no to becoming spiritually alive with Jesus. And one, it breaks my heart, but two, God's word tells us that that's gonna happen. And yet we must continue to be his love and show his love and invite people in to this discipleship process. And it all starts with um, transitioning from spiritually dead to spiritually undead and being born again and alive. This morning, I wanna look at the next stage. And like I said last week, we wanna be careful because spiritually undead and then this morning we're gonna look at spiritual infants, right? And here's the thing is like immediately my, my label radar goes up and I hate labels. I hate labels because oftentimes what labels do is they not only they stick it on a person, but then it, 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 we do it in such a way where we allow them to be stuck there. When it comes to the process of discipleship, the whole idea is to help people, each other, ourselves to become unstuck, right? And so the whole idea between, uh, uh, with one of these phrases is to be more of a, an identifier, than a label, because labels often keep us stuck right where we're at. But when we identify something that is true in our life, then we can say, you know what? Th this is a miss here, and I need to get past this, beyond this. I need to go to the next stage or next level. And so spiritually dead is where we all start out with. And then the next step is being a spiritual infant. And you know, I, again, God's word says a whole lot about this phrase. And just here's a couple of verses. Paul writes this, and Paul talks a, a lot about this maturing process that we're supposed to lay hold of. That he even said, it's not that I've figured it out or have arrived at some place, but I'm still, I'm still working on this. I'm a work in progress. And it's not just God working in me. It's me partnering with him and saying, okay, God, what's my part in this? What's my role? How can I be a part of the solution instead of part of the problem? In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes this. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you still are not ready. You are still worldly. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 13, 11 to say this. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. You know, when Paul's talking about this in the second uh, verse there, in the 13, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, he's, he's, he's uh, kind of referring more to a physical sense. But in that first verse I read, it's definitely more of a spiritual sense. But oftentimes, it, it's great to, to, to mesh the two because there are things that we can pick up and learn from a real physical sense of being an infant to also being a spiritual infant. There's some traits and tendencies, whether we like it or not, that are very similar in both a physical infant and a spiritual infant. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, he says, um, 
he encourages us up that the, encourages us that we are growing in every way more and more to be like Christ. So last week I asked, I had the question, do you want to get well? Jesus actually had that question uh, to the invalid man. But it, it, it's the same question posed to each and every one of us today. Do we want to get well? If we say yes to that, if we're saying, yes, Jesus, I want to get well spiritually so that it can affect and, and, and take over the rest of my life, then the next question I believe that is asked by Jesus and that we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to grow up? Are we willing to grow up? With the, I mean, probably every single one of us in this room know adults that have yet to grow up, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I admit that I'm one of those that's still working on it. But some, you're like, dude, you're 50 years old and your life's a train wreck. Come on, man. <laughs> God wants us to grow up. But then, I mean, like I said, it's a question that we must respond to. And so many times, we would probably say yes, but our actions, our choices, our mindset speak really loud about whether we're willing to or we're not willing to. And so, I got kind of a list here, but I was curious. I know we have uh, some uh, infants uh, maybe in the room or, or parents of infants. What are some traits? I'm, I'm going to ask you to answer that. I know this is weird. But I, I, what are some traits of an infant, of an infant that you could say, well, here's a normal trait of an infant? Crying. Crying. Okay. Obnoxious. Obnoxious. Okay. <laughs> There's definitely some adults that way, right, Levi? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> stare at people without even caring. Stare at people without even caring. That's awesome. Selfishness, okay. Needy. Needy. Excellent, yes. Dependent, Dependent yes. You can't reach the top of their head. <laughs> <laughs> Zach's got some good ones this morning, I tell you. <laughs> I can't reach the top of your head, so. <laughs> yes. Inquisitive. Inquisitive, good one, yeah. Messy. Messy, yes. <laughs> yes. Limited mobility. Limited mobility. Yeah. Stinky. Stinky. <laughs> Thank you. Someone brave enough to say that. Yes. So true. You know what? These are, I mean, I, I'm sure that we can go on and on with this list. And the very, some of the things you mentioned were some of the things I had written down too. Infant traits. Infants need help, Right. They can't often do things or much on their own except maybe drool and, you know, have snot come out and then other fun bodily functions as well. Um, but infants need help. Infants can be messy and smelly, I wrote down. Um, infants are learning quickly, right? They're, I, mean, they're de I mean, they're processing all this stuff. And it, I mean, it's amazing how much they pick up <laughs> in this short amount of time. In, infants are influenced and impacted by their environment, people in it, things around it. Infants are often curious. Infants get excited. Uh, and infants uh, can't feed themselves, right? And that, that last one is a big one. Because I remember as a spiritual infant, going from spiritually dead to being a spiritual infant. Man, my life lined up with a lot of these things. And I needed help. I needed someone or someones to disciple me, to invest in me. And I, I tell you, why, I, I fully admit that I'm still trying to figure this journey out and, and what I'm supposed to look like in Christ. I, I, I've come a whole lot, a long way from those infant days. But it's because God had deliberately placed people in my life to help me. But each and every step along the way, he would ask, do you want to grow up? Because if you do, then I have a plan in place. Not only do I have a plan in place, but that plan includes people, my people, my children, my disciples who are going to help you with this. As we said at the beginning, the uh, title of this whole series is Disciple, Be One, Make One. And not only... Do we want to get to that place? But we got to be willing to help people move from being spiritually dead to be spiritual infants. Next week, um, uh, Gina is going to look at uh, uh, the kind of the spiritual child and stuff. And here's, here's the sad reality. 
in churches across our nation and probably across the world, the two areas that most people get stuck at are these two areas, spiritual infancy and spiritual childness. And God, his word again and again declares and challenges us to step up and step in. And, and we want to be able to um, grow with him. And so, yes, some of those natural infant traits that we, um, we, we know about in, in infants in our life, maybe an infant of our own or a friend, some of those also just transfer into the spiritual realm too. So I wrote this down. Um, spiritual growth includes, and this isn't an exhaustive list. This is just four things the Lord highlighted for me to share with you. And the first one is this, is that uh, spiritual growth includes increasing in our knowledge and understanding of God through his word. And I have learned that the more I get to know God, the more he reveals to me, not just about himself, but it reveals who I am too. And I realized that getting to know him through his word helps me have greater understanding and be able to embrace and walk in who he's created me to be. Because his word tells us that we were created in his image. Now we could never be him, but his word says that we can be like him in many ways. This is part of the discipleship process, is becoming more and more like Jesus. And uh, spiritual growth includes increasing in your knowledge and understanding of God through his word. The second thing is decreasing in your frequency and severity of sin. So deceasing uh, in your frequency and severity of sin. Um, when I first went from you know, a spiritually dead to spiritual infant, man, I, I told God, I said, okay, just so you know, here are the things, here's the list of things I'm willing to give up, and here are the things I'm not willing to give up, right? And, and I love God's grace and his patience, and I could just picture him laughing at me, and just go, okay, we'll see about that. <laughs> and the more I got to know him, and he revealed about himself, he began to reveal about me, and I realized this list over here that I'm like, I'm not giving these things up. He's like, these are sinful things that are holding you back, that are stunting your spiritual growth. Last week, in both of our stories, um, the, the, the invalid and then the woman caught in adultery, he tells them both what? He says, stop sinning. Or for, for, for the woman, he said, go and sin no more. He basically saying, stop, do it. And, and, and to the guy who was an invalid for 38 years, he added something to him. He goes, stop sinning or something else worse will happen. It's like, oh my goodness, I don't want to sign up for that. And some could look at that portion and go, well, that's kind of rude. Well, I mean, I guess you could take it that way. But I love that Jesus gives us warning shots for our own good, whether we want to hear it or not. And here's the thing is that we must, if we're going to grow spiritually, we must quit sinning. And it says that God, through every temptation, so um, tem temptation, I, I always like to describe it this way, temptation is a neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, sin presides. Temptation is not a sin, but sin presides in that neighborhood. I don't know if you've ever been in a part of a city, um, and, and, and sometimes it happens in bigger cities, where you're like, oh, this is not a safe area, right? We lived in Geek Harbor for, for almost 20 years, so west of Tacoma. So whenever we went to Tacoma, I'm like, okay, get your bulletproof vest on, kids. Here we go. <laughs> okay, it's not that bad. But, but there, <laughs> there, there was an area south of Tacoma called Lakewood, which I always called Lake Hood, you know, and for good reasons. Uh, where I grew up in East Portland, um, just a few blocks away is what they call Rockwood, which I now call Rock Hood, because it looks nothing like when I grew up over there. I mean, it's, but so, so here's the thing. Temptation is this neighborhood, and this neighborhood in it presides this area of sin. And if we saw one of these neighborhoods in our, in our physical world that was unsafe, most likely we're not going to spend much time there. And if we're going through it, we're going through it quickly. And most likely, we're going around it, right? Whatever you do, stay out of that area. Temptation's the same way. It's one of those neighborhoods. Stay out of there. 
because in it resides this trap called sin, this destructive force called sin that not only wants to stunt your spiritual growth, but according to scripture, it has come to kill, steal, and destroy everything you are, everything you have, including your possible future. But Jesus says, I have provided a way out for every temptation. You get in and through that neighborhood, I'm telling you, I've got a way out. He's our spiritual GPS, right? And so when we begin to tap into him, we realize that his promises are true and that he's provided and given us a way to get out of that. I love that because that offer goes to anyone who would take him up on it, including the, the, the two stories of the two individuals we talked about last week. We must decease in our frequency and severity of sin. Third thing there to, um, to help our spiritual growth, our spiritual growth includes increasing in our practice of Christ-like qualities. So we begin to trade one for the other. And I call this righteousness or what God declares is right. What God declares is right is righteousness. And it says that he is not convicting us from sin, but he is convicting us towards righteousness, right? And I, I love how the word says that because it's so, so many times we get focused on, on what we're leaving instead of what we're turning towards. And God's like, don't let that define you. That's over. What I'm drawing you towards in me and for me is so much bigger, is so much greater, is so much positively defining than that which you're leaving. Leave it and forget it. And I love that he tells the two in the story last week to, 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 to get up, walk, go sin no more, leave this behind. I love that he tells the invalid man to pick up his mat. And I said last week, I think one of the reasons for that is because he could be tempted to go back to his mat and, and, and go back to that pool side and, and, and lay there. But God's like, pick that up. You are not going back to that place. Amen? Has God delivered you from one of those places, from one of those things? Don't go back. He has no intention of leading you back there. Our enemy does, right? And he does it to stunt your spiritual growth, to, 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 to put a roadblock between our relationship, between us and God. And Jesus is saying, don't allow the enemy to have a foothold and do that. If you want to spiritually grow, then you must begin to increase in your practice of becoming like Jesus and embracing his characteristics and his qualities. The fourth thing, spiritual growth includes increasing in your faith and trust in God increasing in your faith. When we begin to do these things, and this is the beginning stage, and it, we just don't, when we get to the other stages, we don't leave these things behind. This is the foundational pieces of us growing spiritually, not just at the infant stage, but every spiritual stage along the path. We must, we must stay on that path. And, and th there's a story in John 4 about the woman at the well. And I, I'm not going to read it, but I'm, I'm going to encourage you, go read it. Because there's so much in there. I mean, we could, we could do a ton of sermons on this interaction that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman at the well. And those, those four things I just mentioned, man, I, I see them pop up in this story. What do we know about her? Well, we know that she was needy. We know that she was needy. And one of the things is that in this case, she needed water. And so she was going in the middle of the day, which was uncommon, to, to, to fetch this water. But so she was needy. And, and, and Jesus knew this. And he knew that she needed more than just physical water. And he offers her water, spiritual water, that she would never thirst again. And of course, she's like, well, I want this. And she doesn't fully understand. But here's the thing. She was needy. What did we say about infants a minute ago? They're what? They're needy, right? Also, I, I notice in this passage in John 4 with the woman at the well, she didn't know what she didn't know, right? I mean, she, she counters Jesus and says, well, you know, this is Jacob's well. And, it, and so she knew some stuff, right? But she didn't know what she didn't know. She, didn't, she, she, she did not know this truth that not only Jesus was speaking of, but who this was right in front of her. But it was beginning to be revealed, right? And I remember being a spiritual infant, and I was like, oh, I did not know that. 
You know, as I, as, I, as I got into God's word, as I was beginning to be discipled, there were, so, I mean, I thought I knew a lot of things at 18, 19 years old. Shocker, right? <laughs> Most 18 year olds, I mean, I, at least I did. I'm like, I'm the smartest man on the planet. And I realized that it was not true then and not true now. Uh, that, <laughs> uh, but here's the thing, as a spiritual, but I did not know what I did not know. And as I began to spend time with God's people, as I began to spend time in God's word, he began to reveal to me those things I did not know. And as he revealed them, I'm like, oh, wow. I have not been thinking that way. I have not been living that way. I have not been doing those things. And I began to learn. I began to be shown and given opportunity. And I love it because at the infant stage, guess what? I began to grow rapidly. Things began to change in my life. Was I still messy? Yeah. My life was still a mess. But it was becoming less of a mess. Amen? I hope that when you look at your own spiritual journey, you can identify those things. And if you're sitting in this room and you're like, nope, I can't. I'm still a spiritual mess. There's good news. Jesus was sent to help us move through these stages of life so that we become a spiritual parent or a disciple who then goes out and makes disciples. This woman at the well, she was needy. She didn't know what she didn't know, but Jesus was catching her up on that. And then she was caught up in the sin cycle, right? We know this because the fourth thing I wrote down is that her faith increased as Jesus read her book. And that she didn't write a book, okay? So it's not on Amazon. You're not gonna find woman at the well, you know, dot com or a book from Amazon. But here's the thing. He, he's like, here's what's been going on in your life. And he tells her this. And he doesn't do it in a condemning way, but in a truthful way that brings conviction and response from her as she stands there shell-shocked. And her response at Jesus reading her book, she realizes that she has been stopped in sin and that her life was stuck in this sin cycle right? Not a spin cycle, but it's very similar to that. There's been some rides at the amusement park. I, I don't know. I don't know. This, this, there was this one that when I got off it, I, I, I don't know what being in a dryer feels like. And if you have, and you know what it feels like, I'm sorry, you got some mean siblings. <laughs> but this ride felt like that. And I'm like, I never want to experience that again. That was the worst. I'm surprised I did not throw up on that ride. And I'm surprised I'm not throwing up on you now, right? <laughs> That's what a sin cycle should make us feel like. It should make us sick. And we should want off. And so many times people get off only to get back on. When I went on that amusement ride, that was the last time I went on that amusement ride. I was like, I'm not going on that thing again. And I look at that thing and it reminds me of this sin cycle that, that Jesus wants to help us not just get off, but stay off it for our good, for our benefit, for our spiritual growth and well-being. Amen? Her faith increased as Jesus read her book. And our, the word says that she believed. And what does she do? She goes, uh... You, uh, can you can you stay? Because I got I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go tell others. Right here was a woman who was embarrassed of her situation, embarrassed of her choices. Why do I know and believe that? Because she was coming in the middle of the day to fetch water when normally they would go in the morning or the evening before meal times. Right, so she was going in the middle of the day when she got no one was there, and now. All of a sudden, her encounter with Jesus, she's going to go back into that town and tell others, and she does. And the word says that she went back and said, you got to come see this guy. He has told me everything that I've ever done. I believe he's the Messiah, the promised one. And it says the town came, and Jesus spent two more days there. I love this because I look at this story and I see a spiritual infant whose spiritual life was beginning to take off. She knew some things about God, but she did not know what she did not know. And she, Jesus was revealing fresh revelation for her life. 
And she responds in him and said, I want more. Yes, I want to grow up and be like you, Jesus. In Luke 9, we have a a, a sequence of encounters of Jesus with people who want to be his disciples. But these people kind of find themselves at this uh, kind of balancing act of, well, I want to really be his disciple. But what Jesus challenges them with and and what their possible response was could show a sign and degree of uh, uh, spiritual emphasy. In Luke 9, 57 through 62, here's some encounters that Jesus has. And I just list them out like rapid fire. It says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. What a challenge. If someone was saying, I want to follow you and be like you, Jesus just gave him a warning shot. Understand what this is going to be like, my friends. It's, it's, it's not the party you think it is. It's a good party, but what this man probably had in mind identified that he was at that place of not fully knowing and understanding about what he was trying to sign up for. Jesus goes on, the story goes on to say, he, Jesus said to another man, or he said, uh, he, he said to another man, follow me. So Jesus says this to another man. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now it doesn't say whether his father just died or that his father was going to die. I would imagine that most likely his father maybe hadn't died yet, but he was like, you know what? When my, when my old man kicks the bucket, then I'll follow you, right? And Jesus is like, man, there's, there's no better time than right now. And we could read that interaction and go, well, that's kind of harsh of Jesus. But again, he knew the condition of every person's heart that approached him. And he challenged them in their weakness. He wasn't condemning them. He was challenging them in the area that he knew was probably the weakest for them and saying, if if you're going to get past this stage, then here's what it's going to mean for you. It goes on in Luke uh, Luke 9 to say this. um, uh, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead. Okay, then in verse 61, still to another, Jesus said, uh, a guy said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. I think these interactions kind of show some of those excuses, some of those reasons, some of those things like, God, I, I, I want to follow you. I think you're cool and all that and doing a great thing. But I've got some things over here that I need to take care of before I'm fully in. Anyone in here ever guilty of telling God that? Man, I have been. And I realized that in that moment, I'm reverting back to my spiritual infancy. And God's saying, I'm calling you to something greater. And I've laid out the stepping stones to help you walk that path so you can become that which is greater. God has given us the blueprint for spiritual growth. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes this. He says, it is his divine power God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us a very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature of God having escaped the corruption in the world that caused by evil desires. In verse five, he says, for this very reason, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Add goodness. Add to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that word increasing is important because it signifies growth. 
It signifies progress, increasing measure. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is just one portion of scripture where God lays out this blueprint for us to grow in our spiritual walk, our spiritual journey. And we move from becoming spiritually dead to spiritual infants to spiritual children, young adults, spiritual parents. I stand here before you because there were people who understood this and helped me through each stage. I am so thankful for God's word and I'm thankful for God's people because I don't know if I would have got it otherwise. God revealed it and then he provided the help and he still does it today. And that's why we must be a people. We must be a church who is committed to be a disciple and to make one. To look at our own lives and just say, am I spiritually stuck or am I spiritually moving forward? And to look at other lives and go, are they spiritually stuck and can I help them? Because I love them so much and I know God has something so much greater that I don't want them to stay in that place. But I want to help them, him, grow up in him. I want to wrap up here and as we do, I just want to give you key steps to spiritual growth. So this morning, key steps to spiritual growth. The first one is this. We must have God's word as our foundation. And I know this, these probably seem basic, but man, we so get wrapped up in getting away from the basics that oftentimes we need to go back. And God's word must be our foundation. When I began to establish God's word as the foundation of my life, that's when real change and traction started to happen for me spiritually. And I realized that God had created me and called me for something so much more. We need to read, know, and obey God's word. It's just not enough to read it. It's just not enough to know it. But we must obey it as well. Amen? Because the, the obedience part is proof that we truly have embraced his type of life for us. The third thing is we need to be walking in step with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was right when he says, it's a good thing that I'm going away because him who's coming next, hold on. And you are going to experience growth in life like never before. I like to describe it this way. I physically stand before you today because God created me in my mom's womb. <laughs> I am saved for not just now, but for eternity because of Jesus' finished work on the cross in his empty grave. But the reason that I'm standing up here before you today, living like I do, is because of the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Amen? Francis Chan wrote a book a few years ago called Forgotten God. Great book. And it's about how we have left the Holy Spirit out of the equation. And when we do that, it's going to stunt our spiritual growth. We must be walking in step with Jesus through the power of his Holy Spirit. And the fourth thing, believing and embracing all his promises. And they are for you and they are true. So many great scripture about growing up in him. One of my favorites is probably a very, very short and simple one. And I think it perhaps best describes the discipleship summary or, or process. Uh, and it says this in 1 Corinthians. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says, and he makes it so simple. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Think of even Paul's journey. He did not know what he did not know. And that, 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 that interaction with, on, on, the, on the road to Damascus, he, he moved from spiritually dead to spiritually undead. And it says the infant process started. And God helped him through that infant stage, through the child stage, through the young adult stage, to become a spiritual parent that, that God used in an incredible way to help form and direct and change his church. Amen? 
And then what Paul did was he turned around because he, he would recognize so-and-so did this for me. God sent him into my life to help me with this. God sent her to speak this truth. He began to identify these people helped disciple me. And what did Paul turn around and do? He did the same. And when he addresses, if we go back to that first verse that I shared to the church in Corinth, he's like, you know what? You're still babies and the reason I'm giving you milk is because you're not ready for food yet. But I truly believe that his heart and the process that he gave himself to was to help them become ready to be self-sufficient and eating food on their own, spiritual nourishment on their own. This is what a disciple who wants to make disciples says and does. Follow my example as I follow Jesus. He has shown me the way and I can't wait to show you the way. This morning, I don't know if you're feeling spiritually stuck. If you are, there's good news. Jesus was sent to help you out of that rut, to help you out of that ditch. If you feel like your, 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 your spiritual growth has been stunted, Jesus has a plan for that. And he says, do you want to grow up? Last week it was, do, we want to, do you want to be well? Today it's, do you want to grow up? One of my favorite books is by uh, a former pastor, David Ravenhill. And he had a real famous dad, Leonard Ravenhill. But David wrote this book called, For God's Sake, Grow Up. And it's not just for God's sake, but it's for our own too, right? God did not, just like uh, we don't expect an infant to always stay an infant. I mean, have you ever, uh, I mean, maybe it ha does happen, an 18-year-old or 16-year-old throwing a temper tantrum on a store floor, right? I mean, I remember our daughter being an infant and us being in Walmart and her looking like she is doing like a break dancing thing, you know, spinning on the floor, screaming at the top of her lungs. And there have been so many times when that would play out in a store where I was tempted to do the same thing just to show her how ridiculous that would look like, but I was pretty sure I'd get kicked out of the store. Right? No full-grown adult should be doing that. However, <laughs> however, there are God's people in God's churches across this country that still need to spiritually grow up. And I don't say that to be harsh. I say it as an invitation to you or anyone else. Take the next step. Begin to spiritually grow with Him. And when you do, look out because it will not just impact your life, but it will impact those around you. Paul tells this to Timothy in chapter four. He says, if you keep an eye on this and do this well, it will not only impact your life, but those who listen to you, those who follow you. And Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. Be disciples who make disciples. Will you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plan and your process. We thank you that we do not build alone. We get to build our life with you and you have sent others into our life to help build it to be more like you. We thank you for those disciples in our lives who have helped us, who have believed in us, who have influenced us, who have pointed us towards your righteousness for your name's sake. And today, as we stand here, may we tell you, yes, we want to grow up. And we want to grow up and be like you, Jesus. Help us with that. And help us partner with you in building our lives to be like you.